Now, said he, I can comprehend the reason why your minister selected him. I'm surprised, however, that he never told me anything about it. A man of delicacy would not have accepted the task of conducting me here under similar circumstances. You will see, continued he, that in a short time, the English will cease to hate me. So many of them have been and are in France where they will hear the truth that they will produce a revolution of opinion in England and I will leave it to them to justify me. And I have no doubts about the result. Learned from the commissioners, had obtained permission from Sir Hudson Lowe to come as far as the inner gate of Lockwood. Sir Hudson Lowe, accompanied by Sir Thomas Reed, Mayor Gorker, Winyard, and Pritchard, and followed by three dragoons and a servant, rode into Longwood, alighted in front of the billiard room, and demanded to see General Bonaparte. A reply was given by General Montalon that he was indisposed. This did not satisfy His Excellency, who sent again in rather an authoritative manner to say that he had something to communicate, which he wanted to deliver in person to General Bonaparte, and to no other person would he give it. An answer was sent that notice would be given to him when he could be received, that Napoleon was then suffering with a bad tooth. At 4 p.m., Napoleon sent for me and desired me to look at one of his dentis sapientis, which was curious and loose. He then asked me if I knew what the governor wanted or why he wished to see him. I replied that perhaps he had some communication from Lord Bathurst, which he did not like to deliver to any other person. It will be better for us to not meet, said Napoleon. It is probably some bit tease of Lord Bathurst, which he will make worse by his ungracious manner of communicating it. I am sure it is nothing that is good, or he would not be so anxious to deliver it himself. Oof. He's a bad man. His communications are bad, and he is worse than all. Nothing good can arise from an interview. The last time I saw him, he laid his hand upon his saber two or three times in a violent manner, and therefore go to him or to Sir Thomas Reed tomorrow and tell him that if he has anything to communicate, he had better send it to Bertrand. And Bertrand will go to his house, assure him that he may rely upon Bertrand's making a faithful report, or let him send Colonel Reed to me to explain what he has to say. I will receive and hear him, because he will only be the bearer of orders and not the giver of them. Therefore, if he comes upon a bad mission, I shall not be angry, as he will only obey the orders of his superior. I endeavored to induce him to meet the governor in order, if possible, to make up matters between them. But he replied, to meet him would be the worst mode of attempting it, as he was confident it was sympathies of Lord Bathurst's, which he would make worse and convert into an insult by his brutal mode of delivering it. You know, added he, I never got into a passion with the Admiral because even when he had something bad to communicate, he did it with some feeling. But this man treats us as if we were so many deserters. Knowing that Sir Thomas Reed was quite incapable of explaining to him in either French or Italian the purport of any communication exceeding a few words, I asked him, in case Sir Thomas Reed should not find himself capable of explaining perfectly every particular and should commit what he had to say to paper, if he would read it or allow it to be read to him, he replied, Certainly. Let him do this, or said to Bertrand, As to me, perhaps I shall not see him for six months. Let him break open the doors or level the house.
I am not subject to the English laws because they do not protect me. I am sure, continued he, that he has nothing pleasant to communicate or he would not be so anxious to do it personally. Nothing but insults or bad news ever came from Lord Bathurst. I wish they would give orders to have me dispatched. I do not like to commit suicide. It is a thing that I have always disproved of. I have made a vow to drain the cup to the last draft. But I should be most rejoiced if they would send dis directions to put me to death. The second. Saw Napoleon in the morning. A toothache, he said, had prevented him from sleeping a great part of the night. His cheek was swelled. After having examined the tooth, I recommended the extraction of it. He desired me to go to the governor and deliver a message, to purport of which was that a consequence of indisposition, pain, and want of sleep. He found himself unfit to listen calmly to communications or to enter into discussions. Therefore, that he wished the governor would communicate to Count Bertrand whatever he had to say, that Count Bertrand would faithfully report it to him. If he would not communicate it to Count Bertrand or to any other resident in Longwood, Napoleon would have no objection to receive it from Colonel Reed. The remainder of the message was similar to what he had said on the same subject yesterday. If, added he, that man were to bring me word that a frigate had arrived for the purpose of taking me to England, I should conceive it to be bad news because he was the bearer of it. With such a temper of mind, he must see how improper it would be that an interview should take place. He came up here yesterday, surrounded with his staff as if he were going in state to assist at an execution instead of asking privately to see me. Three times has he gone away in a passion. Therefore, it will be better that no more interviews should take place between us as no good can arise from it. And as he represents his nation here, I do not like to insult or make severe remarks to him similar to those I was ex obliged to express before. Went to Sir Hudson though, to whom I made known the message with which I had been charged, suppressing the oppressive parts, but communicating all that was necessary to elucidate its meaning. His Excellency desired me to give it to him in writing, and then told me that the Secretary of State had sent directions to him to inquire very minutely concerning a letter which had appeared in one of Portsmouth's papers concerning Bonaparte, and which had given great offense to his majesty's ministers, particularly as it had been reported to them by Captain Hamilton of the Havana frigate, that I was either the author or had brought it on board. His Excellency then asked me who I had written to, adding, there's no harm in the letter. It's very correct in general, but the ministers do not like that anything should be published about them. Everything must come through them. Also, the Captain Hamilton had reported that it was an anonymous letter and expressly intended for publication. I replied to Sir Hudson Lowe that I had never written an anonymous letter in my life and that several letters had been published in the newspapers of which I had been supposed the author until another individual had acknowledged them to have been the writer. Sir Hudson Lowe desired me to write a letter of explanation to him on the subject, after which he dictated to Sir Thomas Reed what he wished me to express in answer to General Bonaparte, of which I took the following copy, which the governor read before I left the house. The principal object of the governor's visit to Longwood to see General Bonaparte was from a sense of attention towards him in order to acquaint him first with instructions received concerning his officers, which could only be decided by him before informing them. The governor would wish the communication with General Bonaparte should be made by himself in the presence of Sir Thomas Reed or some of his staff and one of the French generals. He never intended to say anything that would affront or insult General Bonaparte. On the contrary, he wished to conciliate 
and modify the strict letter of his instructions with every attention and respect to him, and cannot conceive the cause of so much resentment manifested by General Bonaparte towards him, if he would not consent to an interview with the governor in the presence of other persons, the governor would send Sir Thomas Reed, if he consented to it, to communicate the general purport of what he had to say, leaving some points for future discussion. If Calper Tran was sent to the governor, some expressions of concern would be required from him for the language made use of by him to the governor on the last interview, which the governor undertook by desire of General Bonaparte himself, and the governor conceives the same expression of concern necessary from Calper Tran on the part of General Bonaparte himself for his intemperate language in the last interview with the governor, and then the latter will express his concern for any words made use of by him in reply, which may have been deemed unpleasant. As there was no intention on his part of saying anything offensive, his words being merely repelling an attack made upon him, and this he would not do to a person in any other situation than General Bonaparte. But if the latter is determined to dispute with the governor for endeavoring to execute his orders, he sees little hope of a proper understanding between them. On my return to Longwood, I minutely explained the above to Napoleon, both alone and in the presence of Calpertran. Napoleon smiled contemptuously at the idea of his apologizing to Sir Hudson Lowe. Third, saw Napoleon in the morning. After I had inquired into the state of his health, he entered upon the business of yesterday. As this governor says, he declares that he will not communicate the whole to read, but intends to reserve some future points for discussion. I shall not see him, for I only agree to see read in order to avoid this side of the other. And by receiving the points he speaks, of, he might come up again tomorrow or next day and demand another interview. If he was to communicate, let him send his adjutant general to return or to Montalon or to Slast Casas or go go or to you or send for one of them and explain it himself or let him communicate the whole to read or to Sir George Bingham or somebody else and then I will see the person so chosen if he still insists to see me I will write myself an answer the Emperor Napoleon will not see you because the three last times you were with him you insulted him and he does not wish more communication with you well, I know that if we have another interview, there will be disputes and abuse. A suspicious gesture might produce, I know not what. He, for his own sake, ought not to desire one after the language which I applied to him the last time. I told him before the Admiral when he said that he only did his duty, and so did the hangman, but that one was not obliged to see that hangman until the moment of execution. There have been three acts. She flecked! I do not wish to renew them! I know that my blood will be heated. I will tell him that no power on earth obliges a prisoner to see and debate with his executioner for his conduct has made him such to me he pretends that he acts according to his instructions. A government 2,000 leagues distant can do no more than point out the general manner in which things must be conducted and must leave a great discretionary power, which he distorts and turns in the worst possible manner in order to torment me. A proof that he is worse than his government is that they have sent out several things to make me comfortable but he does nothing but torment, insult, and render my existence as miserable as possible. To complete the business, he writes letters full of smoothness and sweetness, professing every regard, which he afterwards sends home to make the world believe that he is our best friend. I want to avoid another seen with him. I never in the height of my power made use of such language to any man as I was compelled to apply to him. It would have been an 
part of both the Tuileries. I would sooner have a tooth drawn and have an interview with him. He has a bad mission and fulfills it badly. I do not think that he's aware of how much we hate and despise him. I should like him to know it. He suspects everybody, even his own staff, and I free from it. You see, that he will not confide to Reed. Why does he not go to Lord Solerless Casa as if he does not like Bertrand? I replied that Sir Hudson Lowe had said he could not repose confidence in the fidelity of either of them in reporting the purport of his conversation. Oh, said he, he is offended with Montsalon about that letter written in August. And with Liz Causes, because he not only writes the truth to a lady in London, but tells it everywhere here. I replied, the governor has accused countless causes of having written many falsehoods respecting what has passed here. Liz Causes, replied he, would not be blockhead enough to write lies when he was obliged to send the letters containing them through his hands. He only writes the truth, which that jailer does not wish to be known. I am sure that he wants to tell me that some of my generals are to be removed and wishes to throw the odium of sending them away upon me by leaving the choice to me. They would send you away too if they were not afraid. You would do some mischief in England by telling what you have seen here. Their design, I believe is to send everybody away who might be inclined to make my life less disagreeable. Truly, they have chosen a pretty representative in Bathurst. I would sooner have an interview with the Corporal of the Guard than with that Galeriano. How different it was with the Admiral. We used to converse together sociably on different subjects like friends, but this man is only fit to oppress and insult those who misfortune has placed in his power.